Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, delegates to the 2019 IISS Fullerton Forum Shangri-La Dialogue Sherpa Meeting. I'm delighted to welcome you to this keynote address uh, for the seventh IISS Fullerton Forum. The keynote address will be delivered shortly by Mr. Christopher Pine, Australia's Minister for Defence. Australia has vital defence interests in this region and important defence partnerships here. Its engagement in regional security has been reflected in strong participation in and support for the IISS Shangri-La Dialogue and our Fullerton Forum from their beginnings. Christopher Pine has been the Liberal Party member for the South Australian seat of Sturt in the, in the House of Representatives since 1993. He joined the Australian Cabinet in 2013 when he became Leader of the House and Minister for Education. In 2015, he became Minister for Industry, Innovation and Science and the following year Minister for Defence Industry. He was appointed Minister for Defence in the current government led by Prime Minister Morrison in August 2018. As Minister for Defence Industry and Minister for Defence, Christopher Pine has supervised the most important military modernisation program in Australia for several decades. Minister, this seventh Fullerton Forum involves senior representatives from the defence establishments of 24 countries that will participate in the Shangri-La Dialogue in four months' time. Your keynote address will help set the tone for discussions over the next day and a half, and we anticipate your remarks with real interest. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. <coughs> Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, it's a great honour uh, to be here at the seventh annual Fullerton Forum. Over the years, the Forum has earned a reputation for incisive debate on regional security and defence policy and for developing some of the key themes for the Shangri-La Dialogue later in the year. So I thank our host, the International Institute of Strategic Studies. You play an important role in shaping our understanding of the region that we share. And I acknowledge my esteemed colleague, the Minister for Defence, Dr Ng N. Hen. He's a great friend to Australia and a stalwart of the region. This is my third visit to Singapore uh, over the last year. My second is the Australian Minister for Defence, and I first came as Minister for Defence Industry. I'm here shortly after an important announcement by, made by the Australian Government. Manus Island is an island of 50,000 people. It's characterised by rugged jungle, a deep water port, and a strategic location in the Pacific. Last year, at the invitation of the Papua New Guinean Government, Australia has agreed to a major joint initiative which will see the development of the Lombrum Naval Base, the old HMAS Tarangau on Manus Island. This will create a vital opening base for the Papua New Guinea Defence Force and the Royal Australian Navy. The development will significantly enhance our bilateral cooperation and help PNG protect its sovereignty, manage its borders and address a wide range of security challenges including transnational crime and illegal fishing. Our long naval history at Manus builds on many decades of maritime security cooperation in the wider Indo-Pacific. Australia has committed two billion Australian dollars over 30 years under the Pacific Patrol Boat Program, including giving 21 patrol boats to our regional neighbours. The first of these boats soon to be delivered to Papua New Guinea, in fact on Friday, uh, will be named after Ted Dero. It will pull into its new home at Manus Island in just a few days. Brigadier General Ted Dero, the first commander of the PNG Defence Force, spent a significant uh, amount of time as a young man in Australia. Having won a scholarship to attend high school in Queensland, Ted was later commissioned into the Australian Army early in his career before returning home to serve his country with distinction. So the arrival of the patrol boat bearing his name in Manus Island is a fitting first act for what Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced in late 2018 as a significant Pacific step up in our whole of government engagement with the Pacific region. 
This strengthens our economic, people-to-people -people, and security engagement in the Pacific, taking our partnerships across the region to a new level. It builds on our existing cooperation through the Maritime Security Program, Australia's $2 billion commitment over 30 years to the Pacific region. Within defence, this step up includes six areas of focus. First, we're supporting our Pacific partners by establishing a rotational Pacific mobile training team, which will be based in Australia and travel around the region to undertake training and engagement with our allies. Second, the Australian Navy will increase its deployments in the Pacific with more exercises and training and a focus on maritime security targeting transnational crime and drug trafficking. Third, the Australian Defence Force will have a dedicated large hulled vessel to support our increased engagement in the Pacific, to build on interoperability with our partners and support humanitarian assistance and disaster release efforts. Fourth, we'll establish support for annual meetings for Pacific Defence and Police Chiefs in Australia. This will promote stronger relations and develop a shared understanding of the common security challenges in our region. Fifth, we'll provide support for a security alumni network focused on maintaining and, de and deepening the people-people -people connections forged over decades between Australia and the South Pacific. These people-to-people -people links are vital, as with Ted Dero, the young army officer, training overseas builds a network and an understanding of neighbours, which is so very useful to these officers later in their career, many of whom progress to a career in public life. And finally, the South Pacific step up will see an increase in sporting engagements between the Australian Defence Force and Pacific Island military forces. As the servicemen and women in the room know well, on which there are many of you, Sport is a big part of military life, so we'll build personal links across our region, one tackle and one goal at a time. We're also building on significant partnerships across the Pacific. Defence is increasing support to Vanuatu to build their security capability through significant infrastructure upgrades for the Vanuatu Police Force. The redeveloped Vanuatu Mobile Force facilities will deliver enhanced capability and stronger opportunities for training between the Australian Defence Force and the Vanu Vanuatu Mobile Force. We're partnering with Fiji to develop the Black Rock Camp into a regional hub for police and peacekeeping training and pre-deployment preparation. A little over a week ago, Prime Minister Morrison visited Fiji to ceremonially commence that revitalised relationship. For decades, Fiji was one of Australia's closest relationships in the South Pacific. Under the previous Australian government, that relationship was strained. This government has restored it. In a choice between dialogue and engagement or isolation, I prefer dialogue and engagement. The Prime Minister also announced the Fiji-Australia Vivale, which means family or partnership, a broad-ranging and comprehensive agreement for deeper economic security and people-to-people -people links. We've put in place a bilateral security agreement with the Solomon Islands and are strengthening our security arrangements with other Pacific Island countries to underpin our enhanced security engagement. Australia is also delivering and majority funding the construction of the Coral Sea Cable System, a high-speed undersea telecommunications link between the Solomon Islands and PNG. This boost in connectivity will drive economic growth, improve governance and security, and will help create close to 300,000 new jobs in the Pacific by 2040. That's right, 300,000 new jobs, unlocked by the boost to the economy and growth that greater connectivity will provide. Ladies and gentlemen, this year's Australian Defence Force Exercise Indo-Pacific Endeavour will see a major military task force group deployed to the Indo-Pacific region. It provides an opportunity for Australia's Defence Force to demonstrate their capabilities and to work alongside partner nations. In 2019, the, the focus of the Indo-Pacific Endeavour will be the Indian Ocean, in recognition of the Indian Ocean region's rapid economic transformations and increasing strategic competition. Engagement with India, a key strategic partner for Australia, will be the cornerstone of the Indo-Pacific Endeavour 
2019. This task group will participate in a series of activities and exercises framed around port visits to India, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam and here in Singapore. Indo-Pacific Endeavour demonstrates how Australia's strategy for proactive engagement depends on our ability to grow the depth and sophistication of how we work and operate together. Our Pacific step up and the steady stream of lower level engagement and exercises is not a short term commitment for us. It's a significant and enduring engagement underlined by our willingness to play a leading role in supporting security and peace in a potentially volatile region. It is after all our neighbourhood. So the reasons for our step up in the Pacific are clear and compelling. The Indo-Pacific is home to eight of the ten most populous nations on earth. 50% of the world's population, including the world's largest democracy, call it home. Twelve of the member states of the G20, including the three largest economies in the world, are Indo-Pacific nations, not to mention ten of the world's smallest economies. Our sea lanes are the busiest in the world, with nine of the world's ten busiest seaports and many of the largest cities of today and tomorrow. It's no surprise then that militarisation has become a defining characteristic, with seven of the world's ten largest standing armies in the Indo-Pacific. It's a region witnessing a major shift of global economic and political influence. It is seeing the rise of new powers and the re-emergence of old ones. It also plays a host to the defining great power rivalry of our times between the United States and China. The rules-based global order continues to be challenged and requires the reinforcement of all those committed to its continued operation. New and more insidious threats, particularly in the cyber realm, are challenging our security and law enforcement agencies with little regard to borders. As new levels of connectivity and interdependence are brought about by advances in technology and communications, this threat cannot be dealt with by one nation alone. Oligarchies, as well as a host of non-state actors, pose new challenges to regional stability. This is a region on the move, and it's increasingly apparent that it is one in which partnerships must be our direction forward. We will face some difficult decisions about how to prioritise limited resources in this more complex and contested environment. The risks we face are getting too varied, big and complex for any one country to reliably address alone. Australia shares the ambitions of those that want a region where countries have the freedom to make their own choices, where they do not have to be choices between economic gain and sovereignty. And in the Indo-Pacific's vast maritime domains, where global commons abound, it's all the more important that free and open access to oceans is fostered and rules governing maritime behaviour are followed. Countries will be more secure in a region characterised by respect for international laws and other norms, where disputes are resolved peacefully without the threat or use of coercion or force and countries will be more prosperous in a region where open markets facilitate the free flow of trade, capital, technology and ideas, where open markets facilitate prosperity and the well-being of our people. That's why Australia championed the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement and is participating in negotiations for a regional comprehensive economic partnership. We must therefore seek a balance that supports prosperity and helps protect the interests of all states, both large and small. That's why I do not agree with commentators who've sought to describe emerging great power competition as a new Cold War. It's a simplistic and unsophisticated characterisation of what is much more complex and a dynamic geostrategic paradigm. Any division of the region into Cold War-like blocks is doomed to failure, since it would necessitate false choices between prosperity and security. Unquestionably, rivalry between the US and China 
will be a feature of our international outlook in the foreseeable future. However, it's critical that US-China relations do not come to be defined in wholly adversarial terms. Cold War commentary fails to see a fundamental but defining difference, namely that the world's economies are far more closely integrated and mutually dependent than they were when the West contested the Soviet bloc. China has received strong support from major economies, including Australia, in integrating its own economy with systems that have helped underpin and consolidate its growth, most noticeably the World Trade Organization. This is growth we've all benefited from. There is no gain in stifling China's growth and prosperity, and this is not an agenda in any capital that I know of. We are not interested in containing China, but we are interested in engaging and encouraging China to exercise its powers the, in ways that increase regional trust and confidence. The building and militarization artificial features in the South China Sea, for instance, has not increased regional confidence in China's strategic intentions. Instead, it has increased anxiety. On the other hand, resolving disputes in the South China Sea in accordance with international law would build confidence in China's willingness to support and champion a strategic culture that respects the rights of all states. As the exhortation goes, to those that much is given, much is expected. Similarly for nation states, for those with great power comes great responsibility. And so I call on China to act with great responsibility in the South China Sea. The Indo-Pacific we aspire to is one underpinned by the rules-based order, which is open, inclusive, robust, and free of coercion. As such, we welcome China's contributions to global security, including its participation in UN peacekeeping, humanitarian and disaster relief, and anti-piracy operations. Adherence to rules is what delivers security and prosperity, rather than tension and suspicion. Yet the rule of law is under threat in many areas around the world. It's under threat from oligarchies who think it's their birthright to simply annex their neighbour at will. It's under threat from countries who treat all of cyberspace like their own personal fiefdom, to do with as they will, to take what is not rightfully theirs. Australia is prepared to play its part in defending the rule of law. As such, we're open to conducting multilateral activities in the South China Sea to demonstrate that they are international waters. In an age of increasing interdependence, a might is right approach serves the long-term interests of no country. We fall short of our economic potential when parties choose to withdraw behind walls and withdraw from mechanisms designed to make us stronger. Australia envisages a region that is more closely integrated and where we all collectively reject isolationism. We must work together, not apart. It is thus our collective responsibility to preserve a system of rules and standards, a system in which differences are managed peacefully. That is why Australia is strengthening existing partnerships, most importantly, our alliance with the United States. We value its importance and presence in establishing and promoting the norms and principles that have underpinned the region's security and prosperity. ASEAN too is a vital partnership for us and central to the Indo-Pacific. Australia has been intimately associated with ASEAN since its creation in 1967. Part of the genius of ASEAN has been to create frameworks for the engagement of Australia and many others in the region. Forums like the East Asia Summit are a key part of that. As the region's premier forum for discussing strategic challenges, Australia has sought to bolster the strategic role of the East Asia Summit so that it can positively influence the region's rules and norms. And the ASEAN Defence Minister's Meeting Plus has established itself as the premier forum for practical defence engagement between 18 countries. I was pleased to see all of my ASEAN Defence Minister's Meeting Plus counterparts at our last meeting here in Singapore in October. 
it was an opportunity to reaffirm Australia's commitment to co-chairing with Indonesia the experts working group on peacekeeping operations. These and other ASEAN forums provide a platform for us to navigate the rapidly shifting strategic environment. ASEAN's success in rising to this challenge is fundamental to the interests of the region, including Australia. Australia's place in the world has always been tied to this region. We are neighbours, partners and friends, strategically, economically, geographically and culturally. As both the 2016 Defence White Paper and the 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper make clear, Australia's key interests now and in the future lie in the Indo-Pacific. So we're deepening our regional cooperation in practical ways, based on shared interests in defending our sovereignty and expanding our prosperity. The ASEAN Australia Special Summit held in Sydney in March 2018 marked a new era in our increasingly close relationship. The Sydney Declaration affirms ASEAN's central role in evolving a rules-based regional architecture that is open and inclusive and promotes stability and prosperity. It sets out our joint commitment to work towards a more secure, prosperous and peaceful region. Australia has already backed the declaration with real action. For example, it was instituted the ASEAN Australia Defence Postgraduate Scholarship. It's the first of its kind. It will allow the best and brightest defence officials in ASEAN and Australia to work together, compare notes on how the region is evolving and develop strategic thought as a cohort at the Australian National University. We have unique long-standing partnerships with individual ASEAN members like Singapore and Malaysia in the Five Powers Defence Arrangements. Our personnel and training exchanges with ASEAN countries have also built up not only better capability and interoperability among partner forces, but also solid people-to-people -people links. All of this is part of a bigger picture and we're proud to play our part. We're focused on engaging, as a priority, our neighbours and partners in the Indo-Pacific region. In fact, Australia conducts over 70 multilateral and bilateral exercises in the region on a regular basis in support of these goals. These exercises allow us to share best practices, improve interoperability and build trust. This engagement must be underpinned, however, by a robust commitment to strong and effective defence forces. As an island nation, it's no coincidence that the Australian government is investing in the maritime security of the region, and we're not alone. Just last week, I visited Japan and was briefed on the new Japanese National Defence Program guidelines. Japan is investing 340 billion Australian dollars over the next five years, a record high and an increase of 35 billion Australian dollars. Australia strongly supports Japan's efforts to build and modernise their sovereign capabilities and to play a strategic role in the Indo-Pacific that is commensurate with their great economic strength. Australia is deep into the largest build-up of our maritime capability since the Second World War. We're investing over 90 billion Australian dollars in a fleet of 55 leading edge ships, 12 attack class submarines, nine hunter class anti-submarine warfare frigates, 12 Arafura class offshore patrol vessels, one hydrographic ship, and 21 Guardian class patrol boats for our Pacific Island countries and Timor Leste friends. We've also invested in new capabilities, providing greater maritime awareness to both Australia and our partners. One element of the suite of capabilities I'm particularly keen to bring to bear in our engagement in the Indo-Pacific is Australia's expertise and knowledge. That's why we offer over a thousand training positions in Australia to military officers from Southeast Asian nations. We're also boosting our support to those nations' agencies working together to combat a broad range of maritime security threats. The beauty of this engagement is not just in what we give, but what we receive, in the knowledge and experience of our Indo-Pacific partners who want to address the same opportunities and challenges that we do. As the rate of technological disruption add risks to long-term defence projects, we're supporting our generational investment in new defence capability with a significant new focus on building the capabilities and partnerships we have with defence industry. 
we're investing over $200 billion in strengthening our defence capabilities and growing the defence budget to over 2% of gross domestic product by 2020-21. Our aim is to provide a credible force to deter coercion. We live in a more uncertain, competitive and contested world and will need to be increasingly engaged and agile in how we pursue our shared interests. Fundamental to our success will be the understanding that security and prosperity are ultimately linked and that despite this connection, prosperity alone cannot serve as a guarantor for security. We must be architects of a durable peace that anticipates the challenges of the future rather than looks wistfully to accommodations of the past. We must welcome competition, not fear it, by holding ourselves and others to the rules that extend equal opportunity to all. To do this, we need to nurture regional structures that sustain security, build mutual trust and uphold the rule of law. We need to build defence forces that are responsive to new challenges and we need to strengthen cooperative arrangements that draw on our shared stake in individual sovereignty and collective prosperity. There's no question we'll face some big challenges ahead. Australia has moved forward in this space, taking a step up in the Pacific, reprioritising our investments and our effort, refreshing our friendships and alliances and undertaking a significant boost to our defence capabilities. But this is not something we can do alone. It would take the concentrated effort of all the nations represented here to keep our region stable, prosperous and secure. Our default needs to be engagement, not unilateralism, dialogue, not isolation. To recognise that transnational problems need multinational solutions. To put ourselves in the shoes of our neighbours and think from their point of view. I know that's not an easy task and I'm sure I'm not alone in that challenge. But if, if ever there's a time to do it, it's now. Now is the time to reach out and engage. Whenever I meet someone and give them my card, I always say, by the way, I read my own emails. Most people don't believe it. They imagine an army of gatekeepers and staff checking and filtering. But I actually truly do. Because it's the best way to stay in touch with my constituents, the broader Australian public, and experts and counterparts from around the world. And I'm here to reach out to you. I do read my own emails, and I want you to reach out to me, to everyone else in this room, to those you meet and will meet across the great and prosperous Indo-Pacific region. This forum is a fantastic opportunity to do that. By rejecting isolationism, rejecting suspicion, and embracing engagement, we can increase trust, develop closer links, and forge a new path forward. Through such engagement, we can all play our part in safeguard safeguarding our region's prosperity and the well-being of our people. Because when all is said and done, that is our shared responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Oh, good. Minister. Uh, thank you so much for your, your really excellent, wi wide-ranging uh, keynote address, uh, which I think will uh, help us to frame our discussions over the next uh, day and a half. And I'm sure that there are many points that you mentioned in the course of your address that we will uh, want to discuss uh, further um, during the sessions of this, this Fullerton Forum. Um, you've kindly agreed to uh, <laughs> engage in a, a question and answer session for, for maybe uh, the next 10 or 15 minutes. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, if you would, uh, delegates and others here, if you would like to ask a question of the, the media, um, raise your hand. Uh, once I recognize you, the microphone will come to you. And if you could please... Uh, when you start your question, uh, not only say who you are, but uh, which country you're, you're from, or if you're a non-government non delegate, um, which organization you're affiliated with. Uh, who would like to ask the first question? At the, at the back, madam. 
Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm with Phoenix TV from China. Uh, so my first question is, you mentioned the Sino-US relationships. Uh, we know at this stage, uh, the relationships between China and the allies of the US, including Australia, are going through some difficulties. So in terms of regional security, are you optimistic about things getting better in the near future, maybe? And my second question is, we know uh, recently several Canadian citizens and one Australian citizen have been detained in China. So what do you make of that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. The uh, relationship between China and uh, uh, US allies uh, uh, is extremely important that it be uh, open and, uh, and robust and healthy and frank. And I've just been to Beijing and Guangzhou uh, and had an excellent uh, uh, bilateral visit there with um, General Wei Feng He, uh, Vice Chairman Xu from the Central Military Committee, uh, a number of other key uh, players in China. And uh, this uh, represents uh, the first visit to China of a defense minister since 2014. And in the last four months, the trade minister and the foreign minister have also visited China. And that came after 11 months of no senior level cabinet ministerial visits to China. So I think the relationship with China from, a, from an Australian point of view is in uh, positive shape. Uh, and that was the conversations that we had with uh, our Chinese counterparts. There's no doubt that there will be times when there are moments of, uh, of tension in the relationship because uh, China and Australia have uh, divergent views on a number of significant issues in the Indo-Pacific. One of those, of course, is the South China Sea and its status as international waters. And I addressed that in my speech. And Australia reserves the right to navigate the South China Sea and undertake overflight uh, both uh, on its own and also in a multilateral engagement with countries like the US, Canada, New Zealand, France, uh, Japan and others. And we have undertaken those kinds of navigations. And I think the Chinese government understands that that's our position. So I would characterise the relationship with China as healthy and strong. Uh, and I think on both the Chinese part and the Australian part, it's recognised that it's far too important for it to be uh, discussed in a, uh, a trite or a unsophisticated way. In terms of the uh, detention of Mr Young, uh, I don't see any evidence that the detention of Mr Young is linked to decisions that the Australian government has made in recent times, nor do I see it as being linked uh, to the detention of the two Canadians. Uh, the two Canadians uh, I haven't commented on yet, uh, that's been uh, commented upon by the Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, and we've made some statements about that uh, and we support the Canadian government in their efforts to uh, have those two men uh, returned to Canada uh, but I won't comment further on that. But in terms of Mr Young, obviously I spoke to both General Wei and Admiral Yuan in Guangzhou uh, to ensure that he is being uh, well cared for, being treated fair and fairly and transparently and that we have consular access to him uh, and that uh, uh, access has been granted. Professor Ben Schreer, uh, Associate Fellow of the AAAS, Macquarie University. Um, thank you and thank you Minister for your excellent um, speech. Um, I have a further question on the nature of conflict. Um, there seems to be now a bipartisan consensus in, in Washington that the previous policy of engagement with China has largely failed and that what has to happen is a stronger pushback against China. Not so much confrontation, but more comprehensive um, competition. Sorry, tested um, too often beforehand. Yeah, <laughs> academics talk too long. Um, <laughs> w w w would you then um, agree with the proposition that while we certainly not have entered a new Cold War, as you said, um, we have entered into a new phase of enduring comprehensive competition with China on multiple fronts, 
not just economically, but also security-wise, but also ideological. And if you agree with that proposition, um, what would be the implications for the Australia-China relationship long-term? Thank you. Well, Vice President Pence, when he was here at the East Asia Summit and APEC, made it quite clear that America saw the relationship with China as one of uh, uh, rivalry, great power rivalry. I characterise that as uh, competition. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with competition. Australians embrace competition. It usually brings out the best in everybody, individually and uh, in a business sense and hopefully in a government-to-government -government sense. So we don't fear rivalry between the United States and China. Uh, and to pretend that there wasn't some kind of rivalry between those two great powers would simply be to deny reality. The, the way one approaches that and the way Australia approaches that is to ensure that it's a, it's a healthy competition, not an unhealthy one. And uh, as the United States is deeply engaged in the Indo-Pacific, and that is a, not a new phenomenon. Uh, the United States has been engaged in the Indo-Pacific uh, since really the time that the, they decided that the Philippines would become part of the greater United States uh, area of influence. And of course the uh, uh, Second World War demonstrated how engaged the United States was with the Indo-Pacific because it was seen as a, uh, uh, a uh, power centre that needed to be removed. So uh, we welcome the United States' engagement with the Indo-Pacific and I haven't seen that that's changed dramatically uh, under this current administration, uh, apart from the alterations around the trade uh, issue. And I think that has a particular domestic focus in the United States. And I think China and the United States are managing that uh, trade uh, uh, market situation as best that they can. But we do look forward to that being resolved. And Australia is a country that supports open and free markets. Uh, we believe that increases the prosperity and well-being of everyone. Uh, and so we would welcome an end uh, to policies that uh, uh, increased trade barriers uh, and limited freedom of uh, trade in the region. Uh, Australia sees its role as one of being able to talk to both China and the United States uh, openly and frankly. Uh, we are clearly uh, a very close ally of the United States. Uh, we regard the US as our closest alliance in the world, uh, but we don't believe we need to choose between security and uh, prosperity, and we haven't in the past, and we don't intend to in the future. And I think one of the messages from my speech this morning to the region is that they, other countries don't have to either, uh, that sovereignty and prosperity uh, do not need to be linked uh, in terms of their relationship with the great powers in the region. Thank you, Minister. Uh, James Hackett, uh, editor of the Military Balance, IISS. Thanks, Tim, and uh, thank you very much, Minister, for a, a fascinating uh, address. I was interested in your, uh, your um, discussion about Australia's regional step up, and particularly the six areas of focus for Australia. But what about extra regional states, i.e. from Europe, that still have vital interests in the region? On what areas would Australia want them to focus their regional engagement moving forward? Well, we welcome uh, the engagement of France and, uh, and Great Britain in particular in the region. Uh, other European nations uh, routinely are engaged uh, in the South Pacific and, of course, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and I wouldn't want to uh, uh, create a ranking score of, act of engagement, but certainly from Australia's point of view, uh, the Fr France and Britain is most engaged in the South Pacific of the European nations. Germany maintains an interest in the South Pacific and all countries of Europe, of course, have an interest in it. We uh, uh, have encouraged the French and we've had a uh, very supportive ear in uh, President Macron uh, to be, uh, see itself as an Indo-Pacific power. France, of course, maintains uh, uh, territory in the South Pacific, most notably, of course, in New Caledonia, but also in a number of the other islands uh, further to the east. And uh, we welcome France's engagement and would like them to uh, be further engaged. And Great Britain, too, of course, maintains uh, an interest across the South Pacific and in the Indo-Pacific. 
and uh, we have navigated the South China Seas with both, uh, I don't know if we might have with France, we certainly have with Great Britain and we've uh, extended an invitation to do so with France. Our view in Australia is the more like-minded nations uh, are engaged in the Indo-Pacific, and as I outlined in my speech, it's clearly uh, the most important area in the world from a military uh, and economic population point of view, the better it is for uh, extending uh, support for the international rules-based order, for increasing prosperity in trade and open markets, uh, and we would encourage uh, Britain and France to maintain their interest and to extend it, uh, and any other European nations that wanted to expand their relationship here, we'd welcome that too. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Professor Gordon Flake. Thank you, Gordon Flake from the Perth US Asia Center at the University of Western Australia. Uh, Minister, congratulations on a, on a comprehensive uh, and, and strategic speech. Uh, but, but in some respects, you were hitting lots of different areas within the Indo-Pacific and missing some of the broader linkages. And so the question I really have is, as you look at the South Pacific or the South China Seas or ASEAN or exercise the Indian Ocean, what's your vision for linkages within the Indo-Pacific? In other words, do you anticipate as the strategy rolls forward that Japan will be actively engaged with Australia in the South Pacific or in the Indian Ocean? And likewise, will India be joining in efforts in the South China Seas or in ASEAN? How do you see intra-Indo-Pacific linkages and who are the key partners for Australia in that endeavor? Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. And of course, that's your opinion that I missed those linkages between uh, the countries. And uh, if, of course, I'd focused only on the linkages, your question would have been, why didn't you go into more depth on the different issues that I haven't? But that is the freedom that you have as a critic that I don't have as a participant. Uh, now that we've put that minor criticism aside, <laughs> I think what I tried to convey in my speech is that uh, clearly we do see uh, the countries, all the countries of the Indo-Pacific as linked. In terms of Japan, I specifically mentioned Australia's support for Japan's increase in its uh, uh, self-defense forces. Uh, and their $345 billion build-up of their military capability over the next five years and welcomed it uh, in a positive way, probably for the first time that an Australian Defence Minister has done so. Uh, Japan is also engaged in the South Pacific uh, and has been for well over 50 years. They have a very significant uh, uh, humanitarian uh, program into the South Pacific and often in my travels there, I've seen Japanese flags flying over uh, a humanitarian um, uh, infrastructure and, uh, and activities, which we very much welcome. And I think I'm right in saying that at APEC, uh, we announced that uh, uh, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, the United States, and I hope I haven't missed anybody out. I don't think I've missed out Great Britain, but those four countries would build the energy infrastructure in Papua New Guinea as a substantial uh, uh, investment in their uh, economic capabilities. So clearly we see like-minded countries in the region uh, as including uh, Japan. And uh, we'd also like to see uh, that as including uh, India. Uh, and as you know, uh, Australia and the US, Japan and India uh, have re-engaged uh, a grouping called the, quad used to be called the quadrilateral, uh, which is designed to increase uh, engagement and activity between those four countries. Uh, not aimed at any particular country, but simply because we have shared interests, uh, we are four uh, democracies, uh, and we believe in the expansion of the international rules-based order or its support for the international rules-based order uh, and an expansion of activities across the region that create prosperity. And for Australia, this is a very important linkage because uh, there are other countries that geographically sit, you know, you could say sit in the centre of the Indo-Pacific, but Australia is clearly the uh, continental country that has both an Indian Ocean uh, border and a Pacific Ocean border on both the west and the east, uh, all of which we need to survey and protect, uh, and so therefore we do see linkages between uh, uh, the India, uh, bringing India more closely into uh, engagement in the Indo-Pacific. 
we have time for one more question. Uh, Dr. Lynn Kwok, Associate Fellow, IISS. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to push you a little bit more um, on India and what you would like to see from India's engagement. I think it was very clear from your speech that you saw Japan is stepping up its engagement in the Indo-Pacific. Um, we heard um, Prime Minister Modi at the Shangri-La Dialogue last year talk about his concept or his notion of what the Indo-Pacific strategy involved. And I think his, in short, his, um, his broader view was that it's not so much a strategy, but a uh, a sort of capturing of the region and, and, and the countries in the region. So it was a geographic concept as opposed to a strategic um, uh, uh, notion. So um, you've touched quite little about, uh, touched li very little on, on India. Uh, you've mentioned how uh, Australia is trying to increase engagement. But what would you like to see really from the Indian government? Um, would you like to see greater engagement um, in the South China Sea, et cetera? And how do you think the Indian government is responding to such um, uh, overtures, perhaps? Thank you. Well, India is obviously a great power in the region. Uh, it's a population uh, which is, uh, I think, close to exceeding, if not exceeded, China's by now. Uh, and it has an enormous uh, priority in creating the prosperity for its people, uh, the educational opportunities uh, that it sees for many other countries in the region. And uh, we want to assist India in that big economic development. Uh, China has uh, undertaken that kind of massive economic expansion over the last 50 years, uh, and Australia has played its part in helping to build uh, China's economy. And in fact, uh, uh, in the $200 billion two-way trade between Australia and China, I think I'm right in saying about half of that is still iron ore exported from Australia to China, so we still continue to have that engagement on an economic uh, basis with China. And I see a similar future for the India-Australia relationship in building uh, their economic prosperity. Last time I was in India for the Rizina Dialogue last year, I think I'm right in saying that they were talking about building 30 new major cities, which will require a huge uh, economic focus. And we would like to assist India in doing that. So in terms of India's engagement in the Indo-Pacific, I think they and, and we and the rest of the region can benefit enormously from that economic growth in India uh, and in infrastructure, in education, in creating jobs and prosperity. And that leads inevitably to their uh, support for the international rules-based order and a stable uh, regional architecture across the Indo-Pacific. So. Uh, I see India taking an even greater role in the Indo-Pacific over time. Uh, it's no coincidence that the Indo-Pacific Endeavour, which is Australia's large maritime exercise, will focus on India uh, and uh, Sri Lanka, and as I mentioned, uh, five other countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, and we would welcome India's engagement in the South China Sea. Uh, but, but I think that India, who can speak for themselves, but India don't want to see uh, themselves being drawn into a rivalry that is unnecessarily uh, unhelpful to them economically or uh, uh, geostrategically, and we don't uh, wish them to do so. So I think they take a, a view that they are a great power in their own right, uh, and they should be respected and treated that way, uh, and that they will make their own decisions around what their engagement will be in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and we would welcome their engagement. Minister, thank you very much for answering that uh, broad range of questions so, so fully and also, also frankly. I think we all, all appreciate that. Um, I'd like to thank you again for your really excellent uh, keynote address for this Fullerton Forum. Um, uh, there were many important points that I'll take away from that. But one thing in particular that you said which I think should inspire us over the next day and a half in our discussions at the Fullerton Forum, is that you said, we must be architects of a durable peace. And I think that's a responsibility that we all uh, need to uh, bear in mind. Uh, thank you very much again. Um, uh, we now have uh, an opening uh, reception in the lobby area just outside this ballroom. 
uh, and I hope that all our delegates uh, will be able to join that and that, Minister, you'll join us for that reception uh, if you have time. Uh, and then we need to start the first session of the forum this morning upstairs in the Straits Room at 9.45 as promptly as possible. So uh, could all delegates please now remain seated uh, until the minister has left the room. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks, Tim.